Good afternoon and welcome to the spring quarter of the Ignition Center's Bannon Institute, Sacred Texts in the Public Sphere. My name is Teresa Ladrigan Wellesley, and I serve as the Director of Institutes and Spirituality in the Ignition Center. The work of the Ignition Center, for those of you who are not familiar, is to advance the distinctively Jesuit Catholic tradition of education here at Santa Clara by promoting the integration of faith, justice, and the intellectual life on campus and in the larger community. And one of the ways that we seek to do that is through our year-long Bannon Institutes. Today's event is the penultimate event in our Bannon Institute year, and it's entitled Sacred Poetics, Creation, Collaboration, and the Space in Between. The seed for this event was planted a little over a year ago when I had the fortune of visiting Thomas Sigmeyer's studio in San Francisco with Deborah Whiteman, who's the head of archives and special collections here at Santa Clara, and Mick McCarthy, our executive director in the Ignatian Center. I remember climbing up the steps to Thomas and Akiho's home and sitting down with them in the room adjacent to Thomas's studio over a comfortable cup of tea. Together we took in Thomas's work, from daily marking journals, to dialogical art books, to the pieces adorning the walls and framed within the glass table that we were seated at. I was so struck with the vibrancy, spirit, movement, and life within his work, and the way in which his art gestured to, even embodied, the textured conversations and layered interpretations that gave rise to it, even as it inspired further interpretation and engagement from us that day. As I looked out the window of his home onto the courtyard and playground and city beyond, Thomas's work seemed to frame the scene in such a way as it became part of our conversation too. I noticed the light, movement, space, and form playing all around me. And I interacted with it all somehow. I was drawn into dialogue with it somehow. Some of Thomas's work, which he will speak about today, I think, makes visible the work of dialogue itself. Coding exchanges of meaning between Thomas and a whole range of poets, musicians, and artists. When we were initially planning this year-long series on sacred texts, Thomas's work exemplified for me the kind of engagement with sacred texts that we hoped to inspire this year. Texts, particularly sacred texts, point beyond themselves. They make meaning, both for the individual and the communities who claim them, engage them, inhabit them, and then they invite more. They are not exhausted, they are never finished. Rather, they always have a new story to tell. They are revelatory, again and again, as they're taken up in new contexts, with new questions, through the frame of new and diverse experiences, people, dialects, forms, and accompanying emptinesses. In today's event, Sacred Poetics, Creation, Collaboration, and the Space in Between, Thomas Inmeyer will reflect on a number of collaborative projects involving poetry, music, and calligraphy with which he has been engaged. Thomas Inmeyer received a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from Ohio State University and a master's degree in landscape architecture from the University of California, Berkeley. Both of these programs involved intensive graphic and fine art studies. He worked in the landscape architecture field and in the early 1970s discovered calligraphy. He joined English master calligrapher and illuminator Donald Jackson in his one-year program in the art department at California State University, Los Angeles. In 1977, he submitted work to the Society of Scribes and Illuminators in London and became the first foreign member to be elected as a fellow. In 1980, Thomas was granted a Newberry Fellowship for continuing study of calligraphy. 
His early work focused on teaching and calligraphic research, involving the exploration of calligraphy as a fine arts medium. He has taught workshops throughout the United States, Canada, Australia, and several countries in Europe, as well as in Japan and Hong Kong. Thomas has been exhibited widely in the United States and abroad, and his work can be found in the New York Public Library Special Collections, San Francisco Public Library Special Collections, Stanford University's Library Special Collections, and in many other public and private collections throughout the world. We are proud that Santa Clara's Archives and Special Collections contains a few of Thomas's works, and that these pieces and others are featured in our Julian E. Bannon Institute exhibit, Dialoguing with Sacred Text, which we hope you can check out too. Since 2002, Thomas has concentrated on the making of artists' books. He has embarked on a number of collaborative projects, including the Pablo Neruda and Federico Garcia Lorca series of books with Manuel Neri. Work as an illuminator on the St. John's Bible, here, and a new collaboration involving 10 poets, which explores the affinities between poetry, music, and calligraphy. In the later portion of today's event, Thomas will create a calligraphic text, a dialogical performance with violinist Aina Keyes. Aina is on the faculty of San Francisco Conservatory of Music and has performed at Lincoln Center in Carnegie Hall and on international tours as a chamber musician, soloist, and violinist composer. She is a founding member of Musica Eterna. Diana did her undergraduate studies at Sarah Lawrence College and her graduate studies at the National Academy of Music in Bulgaria. Some of her recordings as a violinist composer include At the Museum and Prayers of the Earth, Places of the Heart, Exploring Sacred Sites. We are thrilled to welcome both Aina and Thomas here today. But for now, please join me in welcoming first Thomas Ingler. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank uh, Trace for the very nice introduction. Um, but also for inviting me uh, to speak today and trusting that I can actually contribute something to this discussion on sacred text. Um, given the uh, perhaps forgotten but well known adage that poets or that uh, artists should be uh, doers and not talkers, <laughs> as well as the fact that Seldom has my work been associated with sacred. Uh, there might be a reason to word that. Uh, the St. John's Bible illuminations are obviously one uh, exception. Uh, but my resume before that included uh, some illuminations for the fifth canto of Dante's Inferno. That describes the circle where you go up, you've sinned of lust. And before that, uh, Baudelaire's Flowers of Evil, uh, Arthur and Bowes, uh, Alchemy of the Word, The Season in Hell, uh, William Blake's Proverbs of Hell. So when I received the call from uh, Donald Jackson to work on the Bible project, I reminded him that I had pretty much become the expert on sex, death, and hell, and maybe those weren't the best qualifications <laughs> for a Bible illuminator. And he said, oh, there's lots of that in there. <laughs> As uh, Therese mentioned, she visited the, my studio about a year ago, just in May. And she introduced me to the word sacred poetics and the phrase, the space in between. And as you see, those words became part of the uh, title of the talk today and part of our uh, description of the talk. Uh, and in some ways, I think that uh, description could qualify as a, as a uh, collaboration between Trace and myself. My actual contribution was the, was the phrase before sacred poetics, which was Thomas Ingmar Jostle's The Dynamic <laughs> Sacred Poetics. This was my way of saying, I'm not sure what this is all about. I, uh, I engaged a number of friends during the, uh, during the year uh, uh, 
colleagues and poets and calligraphers uh, asking them how they thought about sacred poetics and calligraphy. And first of all, I can say it's a, it's a good topic for discussion. Uh, and second, the range of answers is extremely broad. One day I decided to Google sacred poetics. At the very top of the list, on the very first page, it said, Santa Clara University Ignatian Center <laughs> <laughs> presents sacred poetics, creation, collaboration, and space to be think by promising mark. I thought nobody knows. <laughs> I get to decide. I can't really uh, I can't really say, however, that I've been able to figure out exactly how to solve this puzzle puzzle of how to discuss the topic, other than, than to present uh, some stories about work that I've done and hope that each of you can build on that with your insights about the idea. Uh, for the past 10 years, I've been involved in uh, three uh, special collaborations. I think Teresa, Teresa actually mentioned them, but the, uh, the St. John's Bible Illuminations, uh, amazing project that spanned 15 years and involved I think 20-some professional scribes and artists and assistants in the production of that. Another one that was very uh, dear to me was a, a project that I called Words for Peace, but it, this happened during the run-up to the Iraq War, and I started with a, a simple idea of making a little book with a, with a few statements by friends. And as it turned out, it went from a little book with the help of friends in the community to three uh, amazing installations. Over a thousand people from 30 countries were involved. Uh, and the first installation was at the San Francisco Public Library, uh, and then the Canessa Gallery in San Francisco and the Fresno Art Museum. And the last one that Teresa mentioned was the uh, collaboration with Man Maneri. And this project also spanned about five years, and at one point, all of these projects were going on at the same time. So it's been a, a very rich period for me in those in the past 10 years. Um, on the, the monitor, I will say, um, you know how the basketball players look shorter on your wide screens? The work is a little bit shorter, too, <laughs> sometimes. Um, but the project that I want to uh, concentrate on today is a uh, a collaboration between uh, music, calligraphy, and poetry, or more accurately, I should say, a calligrapher, a poet, then more poets, and then music. But it starts with a, a story, a uh, very innocent story, and now it seems that it has no, really no end. In uh, February of 2004, I received a package in the mail from uh, not something I was expecting at all. And I opened it up, and it was from a publisher, IS Press, uh, and they're in West, Yorks Wor West Yorkshire, England. And enclosed was a poem titled Kabula Grat Victoria, uh, dedicated to Thomas England, and two poetry books, all by a poet named David Manu. And the note from the publisher said, uh, that these were sending gratitude for the inspiration given to the poet by your exhibition in Bruges in 2002. I thought, oh, it's a nice gesture, but I'm worried that they have the wrong person. I, I didn't really recall having an exhibition in Bruges, uh, but, I, but I had been there, and, and then I started to think, oh, I was there in 2000, and a small gallery bought some pieces of work. Uh, so I thought, well, it's conceivable that they, that this is the right person and he will see them. So I wrote a letter to this uh, David Anu and thanking him for the books and the, just the gesture of writing, but as well writing this amazing poem. And he, uh, he sent a note and he said, your work at uh, Bruges gave me a great gift. It freed the flow of words after a period of silence. 
I felt and still feel as if you were showing me new signs of ways and ways of moving through space. And I remember uh, and upon reading that, thinking at that period in the early 2000s, I have been working on a, a, a series titled uh, The Space of Writing. Uh, I eventually decided to do a uh, interpretation of David's poem, and I wanted him to be involved in the project. Uh, so I did two things. One, I sent him some pages and asked if he would write his poem in his own hand. Uh, and then I was interested in learning about his, his creative process. So I, I put some questions together and sent them to him. And then he, he responded. And I included those questions and the responses uh, in, the, in the book. And to one question, uh, which was, how do you see your poems as stories? as thoughts, or as sounds, David replied, uh, my poems are increasingly dances, plays of hazarded action in space, not so much stories, but choreographies of sound and marks on paper. Sometimes it's as though my fingers sense which way to fly through words before my mind does. It's as though I let my hand free to make linguistic marks down the page before my conscious thinking catches up with it. And so here's this person writing about his poetry, and I felt like it could be something written by a photographer or an artist. Uh, also, it's always wonderful to get his responses. In, they were in themselves uh, wonderfully written. And, uh, so taking that uh, lead, I decided to develop this book in a more spontaneous way. So. Uh, Often, I would each day take a phrase or uh, a few words from David's poem, and then I would create an image. So this is one with the invisible Lucian nodes, uh, another one, multiple at flourish, and uh, I like C. <laughs> uh, after this period, David and I uh, an exchanged an occasional email uh, and Christmas wishes. but. Uh, about three years ago, uh, a friend had, uh, or a client had asked me to uh, find some poetry to go with some drawings by Oliver Jackson. And Oliver Jackson is a, a Bay Area artist uh, whose work is often associated with the rhythms of jazz and blues. And I immediately thought of, of David, and he, he, uh, I sent him the images, and he developed a series uh, that he titled nine starts, and it included uh, uh, lines like uh, toe tap, hip sway, head sway, handler, shouting out, rages, thicket, related letter verb. And he wrote a note that he said, again, he was working spontaneously, but he noticed in that process of working uh, the way it split words and flung syntax into uh, new shapes. I uh, created a book titled uh, Seismograph Jitter, uh, Toad Tap, Dip Sway. And I, in, I included both uh, inspiration from the poem, but also from the uh, Jackson drawings. The uh, serendipitous nature of our uh, relationship always continued, I mean, continued to amaze me. And uh, this book, for example, uh, this one titled 17-6-2011. Uh, I, th I think I had a particularly bad period of not being very productive. And so one day I thought, I'm going to have something at the end of the day. I'm going to make a book today. Uh, and so I started with the date. And I went to my bookshelf, and I pulled the 17th book, 6th book, 20th book, 11th book. And then in the 17th book, I went to the 17th page, and went to the 17th line, and wrote the 17th words. And I did that with all, all of the books. And I, I ended up with this sort of connected, disconnected uh, poem. And then at the end, I added up the date, and it comes to 54. So I'm walking the line, counting the books, and I come down 54. It's the book, one of the books of poems that David had given me. 
And so I went to the 54th page, and uh, as you can see, every fifth or fourth word. But as it turns out, this was a book or a poem that David had written uh, for a Hungarian artist uh, who he had done other collaborative graphic poetic collaborations with. Uh, when I finally met David, and I did, uh, I gave him the book. Our meeting, somehow it seemed to be inevitable, inevitable, but I decided if it wasn't inevitable, it was essential. I was going to just go someday and show up on the doorstep. But I had been asked to uh, uh, organize a uh, summer week-long calligraphy workshop at Sunderland University in the UK. And one of the ideas was to invite uh, a guest artist, some non calligrapher And I immediately thought of David, and he was available and agreed to join us. So in the morning, he did uh, kind of a poetry writing class for calligraphers, uh, and where there were about 100 people. And then in the afternoon, uh, we taught a workshop together uh, with about 20 people. And music was part of our, uh, some of the exercises we did. And so uh, in one of them, we had a long table with 20 people working around it while the music was playing. And they're making marks. And meanwhile, David uh, had a piece of paper pinned to the wall, and he wrote a poem in that span of 12 minutes. And at the end of it, he read his poem, talked about the words, and then he shared his enthusiasm for the uh, process, uh, saying that he felt that it represented uh, an innovative and uh, unexplored direction in the field of poetry. So as a result of that, after we returned to our, I was going to say, respective homes, but respective countries, uh, we decided to uh, embark on some kind of uh, collaboration to see if we could explore this idea a little bit further. And my thinking was, OK, I'll do some images, and I'll send it to David. Uh, and then if he writes a poem, I could use make a synthesis of the two, my marks and his uh, poem, uh, as a way to create new letter forms and uh, calligraphic compositions. And so this is just an example of a music page and then uh, my designing Ain't Nobody King of the Street. And another one, uh, the music page on the left, and then a Soaring Spring, Dancing Flight. Oh, misspelled. Sorely in Spring. Uh, one of my uh, dealer, book dealers who buys some of my work some of the times, he said, he says, well, if there's a mistake, that's how you can tell it's an Ingmar or is Anyway, I did some more music pages, working in different sequences, with different tools, and as strange in music as I can talk Where did you find that music? I just about, <laughs> Where did you find I just about got run out of my house. Uh, <laughs> you know, Listen to that thing. Um, I think how I found the music sometimes uh, I was telling people I was searching for strange things. A lot of people know interesting things. So I was getting all kinds of ideas coming at me, and then sometimes finding it uh, was difficult. But I sent David some, uh, some of the pages, and he chose this one. And I, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but I was thrown off a little bit. Part of it is we really had not defined uh, a process of working, or even what we were aiming for just this open-ended thing. But I had seen the, the music images as kind of like modern, modern musical scores. And I was thinking more of the rhythm of the words of poetry or music that might be associated with it. And it was clear here that David was looking at it as a, as a picture. Um, but I thought, OK, I'll, I'll continue with how I had planned. Uh, and, but I also thought, since we don't know what we're doing, I'll give David some options. 
So the first one on the left was what I had originally intended to do, which was an image that uh, was created just with the letter forms and the words of the poem. Uh, the middle one was a kind of a recreation of part of my original sketch with the words fit in. And then the third one was a, just a new drawing inspired by the poem. Uh, and I sent a note to David, and I, I suggested, I said, well, why don't you pick one, David? Uh, and, uh, and we can go from there. But David, uh, as I already realized, I think of him as a kind of poetry writing machine. Um, <laughs> he wrote a new poem for each piece. <laughs> and so we have this first one, wave top forms flies through spindles and tones, flavors, currents, coalescing out of the air, uh, sighing for the falling black sound, bird skull waving. And he, he sent a note to me, he said, uh, when I asked him to pick something, he said, I decided completely to ignore, put out of my mind, my previous poem, and give my immediate fresh responses to your images. So these three works are all new and exactly written down as they first emerged as I gazed at your So this was the first stage, and in a way, this idea of a sketch and the words was the easiest one for me to work with. So I presented him with the second stage, uh, and then he wrote another poem. Um, and, and the part that I guess was interesting to me is that David was seeing these pieces that included words as images, and he was writing new poems as if they were images. I couldn't get quite past the idea that the images were writing and words. And so I had writing and words and then a new set of words that I was supposed to put together. Um, I have some new ideas about that now, but what we ended up doing was creating three separate strings of uh, this back and forth. David wrote seven new poems, and I ended up creating about 15 different Pieces. The number of pieces I created, uh, many of them grew out of a, more of frustration. I think, what am I doing? And so I would do things like this one on the left, and I would send these to David later. And, he, and of course, the ones he liked the best were always the ones that were most illegible. Uh, and it came from this, uh, I guess, this period of uh, anxiety and frustration for, for me. Uh, we both completed this phase in uh, slightly different ways. I uh, developed a book uh, that we gave the title Out of the Air, and in it I included my, uh, my, some of my first sketches, and then uh, David's poems written in a formal uh, calligraphic hand. And then David uh, wrote a long paper that was uploaded on a, in a uh, British uh, poetry blog, and I was interested at the end, he, he actually developed this uh, glossary for, to describe the, the new ways we were working. And I think the one that's probably closest was the one reactive, correlative, or reciprocal, successive, ecthesis. I thought, say that 10 times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've thought a lot about the process of working with David, and that some of my most interesting was in this space of not knowing, a uh, little bit unsettling, but I, I sort of felt like maybe that's this, uh, that's this space in between, that's this place that uh, perhaps it's important to embrace that uh, as opposed to always thinking you have to know. I put this up, uh, David was one of the persons I asked about this idea, what are your thoughts on sacred poetics, and I particularly like the last, uh, the last two sentences. Uh, when we're inside our craft, as it were, we bear witness to something other than we know that to be sacred. And I felt like that, that connected with that feeling. Um, another beginning. At that point, David and I were uh, energized, but at the same time, this all happened very quickly. So I suggested 
Uh, why don't we ask some other poets uh, what do you think about that? I'm curious how other poets would respond. And he said, oh, good idea. And he, he sent me six names, uh, four poets from England and one from Singapore and one from the Philippines. And he wrote and told them that I would be contacting them. I also invited uh, three other poets uh, from the Bay Area. I sent each of the poets a series of music sheets and then a letter that described what David and I had been doing um, and some other images of work that I had done before. And I asked them if they were interested in participating, if they could choose an image and then align it with something they had already written or if they uh, had the time and interest, I'd be delighted if they would write it. Six of the people actually wrote new poems, and the others submitted uh, uh, poems that they had already written. And I want to just go through uh, uh, and introduce you at least to some of the some of the poets and some of the work that we did. Uh, this was a uh, Jack Kirschman, and Jack Kirschman is a he's a character uh, who's lived in San Francisco's North Beach. Uh, <coughs> for 40 years, exactly the same time that I've been there. And I've seen him uh, often, and we exchanged readings. Uh, and, but I always, and I knew he wrote poetry, but he was a, I mean, at that time, in the North Beach, everybody was a poet. So I didn't know exactly <laughs> what kind of poet he was. And uh, kind of a scruffy looking guy. And uh, I decided, I, w I want to invite Jack, but I'll explore a little bit more just to find out about him. The only thing I have heard is that he, he, he was, especially was translating poetry from the Czech language. Uh, the reality was uh, he had a PhD from Indiana University, and we actually turned out, we were at Indiana University the same, same year. Uh, he taught at Dartmouth and UCLA, got fired at UCLA for encouraging his students to dodge the draft, which made him even more of a hero, uh, this was the Vietnam era. Uh, and uh, he often goes to Italy, where as a poet, apparently, he has a home of godlike aura. <laughs> and he not only translates from Czech, but also from Russian, French, German, Greek, Italian, oops, uh, here, back. Uh, Spanish, Albanian, Yiddish, Vietnamese, and Creole. So, uh, so I was almost, after I learned all that, that I don't know if I can invite this guy. This is too much. But I, I finally uh, made contact with him. And he picked this image, and he uh, selected this, uh, or he wrote this poem, High Blues, or another name he gave it to. Gave it was the contradictory uh, Kabbalah Blues. And then along with it, he sent a note. He said the poem's form is Japanese. In other words, I use 17th syllable consciousness. It's hopefully musical, and because of blues, it has some subtle rhymes. It's got syllabic play and invokes the Kabbalah music of letters because that's what your work evokes for me. Uh, and in some ways, I, this was, I, was, I think, closer to what I, I think I originally uh, had thought about in connection with the, uh, the idea of putting music in, in poetry and calligraphy together. I started by recreating my uh, uh, calligraphic image that he chose in colors, and then I uh, designed the alphabet. Uh, and ultimately, I made a small book. And I got together with uh, Jack and showed him the books. And his awareness of me was similar to mine. He says, oh, I felt like I've known you all these years, but I had no idea this is what you did. And so we talked about the possibility of doing future collaborations. And he said, certainly use my poetry anytime you want in your work. The next uh, poet was a British poet, uh, Geraldine, Geraldine Monk. And she's regarded as an innovative or experimental poet. And her work often incorporates uh, song and found uh, text. Her choice of this 
and this connection with the song was interesting because on my way to Sunderland University to meet David, uh, we stayed at a friend's house in uh, Cambridge and met this uh, young man who uh, was a classical guitarist uh, and very fine composer. And, a, and a, also does Japanese calligraphy very well, but he was quite interested in my experimental uh, calligraphy, and we talked about what I was going to be doing at Sunderland, which was working with music, and the idea uh, sort of grew that I asked him, would you be interested in possibly creating a musical score to some of my calligraphy? And he was very enthusiastic about the idea, and when I started this project, then I sent him some of my images, and he chose the same one uh, that Joe uh, shows. And I thought, should I send him the poem, or maybe just see what happens with the music? So for this one, I decided, okay, I'll just not send him the poem, and I'm curious to see what he would create and how it would fit with the poem and my calligraphy. So he created this piece he titled A Stream, and in part it had something to do with the tsunami and the earthquake tragedy in Japan. But I thought the uh, connection between the, the feel of the, of the poet, the poem, and then the calligraphic interpretation, in this I, I let my abstract marks gain into a kind of uh, calligraphy. The next poet, Alan Housley, also a British poet who happens to be married to Gerald Poe. Imagine two poets in the same family. Uh, he, sent, uh, he sent this poem called uh, White Persimmon. And he described it, uh, first of all, he said, when I saw this piece of yours, it reminded me immediately of this, of this poem that he called a form poem. Uh, and he said, as a form poem, uh, by its nature, it has no fixed or final form, so you will have complete freedom in your interpretation. Uh, Alan uh, Housley, he also works as a painter and a collagist and a book illustrator and designer and all of these things and he formed his poetry but he, but he did have this calligraphy, this uh, visual uh, background and I tried some images uh, that were a synthesis of these two uh, but I wasn't that happy with them and I remember sending them to him and they didn't fit his idea either but what had intrigued me right from the beginning was his description of the performance piece, which was to be made by three, what he called anti-choirs. Anti uh, and uh, they present them a bit like a, a, a round. Uh, and so the idea that the, the work starts with a silence, the words start with a silence, and build up, and then go back to something silent. Uh, and, he, and he said, uh, that the voices are to speak or sing in whispers as if telling a secret that they had seen something rare and wonderful. So I made an interpretation and I decided to get into I was doing most of these in a small book. Uh, so this becomes the title page, which is intended to be mysterious because you can't really read anything. And then this uh, writing of the poem over and over trying to capture the sense of the din of voices. And then it uh, moves back to a silence in the last part where you can actually read the poem. Uh, and so it's like discovering what this is about. I have to apologize for the next, this next one, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> The next poet uh, was Robert Shepard, also a British poet, and he's a 
critic. Uh, he was a professor of poetry and poetics at the University of Edge Hill in Livermore, England. Um, and he's worked with other uh, graphic artists in his poetry. So he was, uh, he was quite responsive and really interesting to work with. But he chose this poem from a recently published work, uh, a book titled Warrant Error, which was a pun on war on terror. Uh, and I, I made my uh, first synthesis to try to develop a couple of calligraphic solutions, but I couldn't get past the imagery suggested by his poem, so I also did these uh, paint, more painterly pieces. And I sent him all of them, and he, was, he had comments on all of them. They were really quite good. And the piece that he liked best was the one on the left that is uh, without the one with the fewest words. I eventually decided to make a book where I incorporated my drawings uh, and then also introduced his poem uh, in fragments, a few words from each line at a time. Uh, and I remember showing this to, to a small group of people and one person said, does the poet know what you've done with his poetry? <laughs> oh, I haven't told him. <laughs> uh, so I, then I all of a sudden started to worry about it. Uh, and so I sent him a PDF of these images, and I suggested that they were, were they were like sketches, but kind of an idea, inviting him perhaps to uh, rework the fragments, or if he really thought it was a bad idea, please tell me. I, I want him to learn. Uh, I received an email back, not dear Thomas, anything, just the words, utterly brilliant. I wouldn't <laughs> change anything. Uh, thank you for doing. So that was, that was quite nice that day. Um, Christine Kennedy is another uh, uh, British poet, and she works both with visual and verbal poetics. Uh, her way of getting to her poem was, was unique. She saw the page as a kind of writing, and so she decided to scan it through a, a software program called Abbey Fine Reader. She scanned it all four ways, and it's a, a program that detects language, and she said, English, please. Um, and then it spit out these pages, like the one in the middle, with bits and pieces of letters and typographic symbols, and then she ran that through a Microsoft Word spell check, and she ended up with a list of words. And those words then became the basis for her poem. She said the only word that wasn't there was uh, the word taiyu. Taiyu is the precursor to the Japanese geisha. Uh, and the poem is titled then, Diva Fall Jai, Mr. Bird Visits the Taiyu. Uh, a really delightful poem. But I like this connection both with the Japanese and the geisha. And had this idea that uh, somehow a fan or something that would link uh, to the idea would be a nice way to present it. And I had met earlier in that year a Japanese book artist. She was uh, in the Bay Area uh, with her husband for a couple of years, and she did not only very conceptual uh, work, but also really interesting uh, structures. And so I asked if she would be interested and willing to uh, work with me on this project. So she created this uh, structure that you can actually, you can open like a regular book. You can. She ended up calling it a water wheel structure. You can put it in a complete circle. Um, this dummy one she did, you can, you can almost wave it around the room. It's very flexible, really beautiful uh, uh, rendition of that. Uh, Paul Kwan is a, a I met, uh, he lives in San Francisco, but I met him during this project, and he's a, he and his partner are actually uh, documentary filmmakers, and they're best known for a film titled Anatomy of an Ankle. Uh, he said, I like food. Uh, but uh, it was, a, it was a, a documentary that was trying to reconcile his uh, Vietnamese upbringing with uh, his life in the Western, uh, Western world. Uh, and in it, he, had, he read a couple of his poems. And I remember liking the poems very much and asking if he would contribute to the project. Uh, and he doesn't write that often now, so he was excited to kind of step back into that uh, world. Uh, his poem, uh, 
also deals with this uh, similarly to his uh, uh, film that's trying to reconcile East and West. I showed him my first sketches. Uh, and so the nice part, at least with the few poets in the Bay Area, is that I could sit with him. And I got a sense that uh, it was important for him to see his words so that they could be read. And I felt that it was important to honor that aspect of his work. I asked him uh, about his process of working and about sound and music related to the words. And he said something quiet, maybe classical, but, but close to silence. Uh, so I did a, a book then that was a, I think of it as a word and image as opposed to an expressive uh, interpretation of the poem. And I, I wanted to present his poem in the form that he wrote it, and just very quietly uh, connecting with the image that he chose. And the final, again, in this kind of constitutive form. The last poet that I want to introduce, uh, I decided he was, uh, again, a British poet, but kind of like the absent-minded genius professor. He, uh, uh, his works as a publisher, a teacher, and a performer uh, associated with the British uh, Poetry Revival. And he's now a, a professor of poetry and art at the Manchester uh, Metropolitan University in England. Uh, and he's exhibited his own work widely, and he's represented in the Tate Gallery. But he sent this uh, poem in this form. And in my computer, though, it opened up with a warning that uh, the file wouldn't open. And yet, here it was. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe since there was that warning, I should check with him, because I thought the form was seemed a little strange. I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, but I wrote, and I asked, is, uh, is that the correct form? Uh, and he wrote a very short email. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> He didn't send an image either, and I thought, oh, okay. And I wrote and I asked him, did you, uh, was this poem based on an image? And I got a letter back that said, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. And so bravely, another email I wrote and I said, well, that's okay. I think I can still work in reverse. Can you suggest some music that you would link with your poem? I didn't hear anything. Not for days, not for weeks, not for months. And so I, I kind of checked this guy off. Um, then one day I get a note that says, is it too late? Can I still contribute to your project? OK, that would be fine. And he sent another poem, no image. So I, then I wrote this. Uh, was there an image associated with it? He said, oh, yes, I forgot to send it. So he sent the image. And then about two weeks after that, another email said, oh, Remember, you asked about some music for my first poem. And this really is six months ago. Uh, and so he gave three suggestions. He said, they're a little strange. He said, if you don't like them, just assume a, a motorboat going across the lake, slowly speeding up. Which made me very curious about the music. But first of all, I really liked the form of this uh, poem. So I started a book uh, uh, creating, recreating an image with that form. And then I got the music and I played it. And I used it to make backgrounds for the book page. It goes on for like 20 minutes. It's great for making a mark every few seconds. <laughs> terrific stuff. I so I made these pages, and then I inter introduced his poem into the pages, uh, and as well as along with some images. Uh, and then I sent him a, a PDF of the, of the pages that I had done. And again, I didn't hear anything. After about three weeks, he gets an email, and he's rewrites and he says, um, I don't think I've written you about your book. He says, I've spent all this time enjoying the pages that you created. Thank you very much for sending them. Sorry. He was a lot of fun. 
Uh, these are just some last images that uh, of some of the works that I did with the other uh, other poets. Uh, and the stage of the project now is uh, I'm trying to make one book that includes all the poets, or all the poets and all the poems. So in some ways, all of the interactions uh, represented a kind of research. So this book is underway, but not complete. And these are just a few of the images. Uh, the main task, in a way, is how do you connect these poems that don't actually connect that well. So I look for uh, verbal transitions sometimes, other times visual transitions. So the good part of this uh, uh, presentation coming to an end is I finally can go back and start to work on that part. <laughs> um, the part that I, I think I mentioned early on is that the project seems that it has no end. Uh, this phase, obviously, the completion of that book will end it, but the part that seems to be beginning now has to do with the, the musicians. Um, aside from uh, Hide Takamoto doing the rendition of uh, uh, Geraldine Monk's poem, um, a friend of David's, uh, who's a, a composer, wanted to do uh, something inspired by a book that David and I did called Out of the Air. Uh, I have a, another friend, uh, Clifford Burke, who used to live in the Bay Area, but he's now uh, uh, in Arizona. If, to give some idea of Clifford, he has a school called the Academy of Accidental Art. But he's a, he's a poet, a typographer, uh, a musician, a very amateur musician, he said. But he created a, 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 what he said is the most spontaneous you can imagine, for the Afghanistan poem. And just the other day, uh, Ide Takamoto uh, sent another one which was based on, the, uh, inspired by the uh, Diva Fall Jive. Uh, and he worked both with, had both the poem and the image. So I'm going to uh, finish this phase uh, by playing just little bits of these three pieces or four pieces. <laughs> what I'm going to do with this now because it does seem to be really fresh and new and, and where do you take it or how do you present it um, uh, but so I haven't I, I know people are doing things to making marks and doing things to 
music, but I think the connection with poetry adds a dimension to it that does seem to be quite fresh. So uh, I don't have much more of an answer to that, but I'm excited to see what the possible well, I have two suggestions. Good. What is going to be some of the artwork side by side. And another suggestion is if you're viewing the poetry on the internet, you could also view companion images. Yeah. You know, at your discretion, you know, click on this to complement right. the reading. I'd love no, to see that. I think there's, I might think, since I make books, my, uh, my real uh, idea is that modern technology, in spite of the kind of short, <laughs> short people we see on our screen, uh, is moving such that I kind of think that it won't be too long before there, there might be a way of putting a chip in a book that would like a book could come alive with sound and even moving images. So I think I think there's a there's lots of possible directions. Well, for example, if you're reading an e-book on, uh, yeah. on a Kindle, on a Kindle Fire, then how about some auxiliary? I mean, uh, 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 it's already there. Um, with, with each different culture of um, a poet or musician that became punk, did you look back into uh, the kind of calligraphic cultural history of each artist when you came to Of the poets themselves. Or musical piece? Um, not, not really. There, there were, I mentioned there was a, there were there was a, a woman from the Philippines uh, who sent her piece to me that she actually did in calligraphic hand. Um, but I didn't really include that in my in, in my process of, of working, which would be another another bit of research that would change everything. Have any of the poets recorded themselves? One, it wasn't possible to yeah. read the poems on the side screen. Yeah. One, the, one, so woman, so yeah, one woman from the Philippines did send me a recording, and I didn't use it today, unfortunately, because it wasn't a good, it didn't work with the system here. But it, her voice was really wonderful. And again, just having that reading of her poem changed the interpretation that I Because I did something and sent to her, and then when I heard her voice, uh, sounds. So that would be that. I did, I've heard the, uh, some of the British poets read other, other poems of theirs. So I have a sense of how they read, but I, not, none of these poems other than one. Because that would be another, another tie that you could easily put in. Um, last weekend, I came to see the production called Sound Sound. A couple more questions. I was going to say that James Brown has performed on stage the last legacy with a cello. So it's Okay, so we're, we're going to have a small break here uh, to move some things. And then uh, I need a who has a nice five minutes. Uh, we're going to do some kind of work together. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we're set up. So, uh, just a few minutes. Later.
So for the next part, uh, I first first of all, you'll find uh, for me it is a very gifted violinist. Um, I'm so excited just to listen to her work. But I first saw her was it November, December last year, and she was working with a, a mutual friend of ours, a Japanese calligrapher, who was doing uh, quite a small but uh, traditional Japanese. And then Ainea was uh, just following his movements on the violin, and then that would go into uh, her doing an improvisation. So they kind of worked back and forth. But I contact, contacted her after that, not so much to do a performance, but I was interested in talking to her about this project that I had been doing, and that there were other musicians involved, seeing if she would be interested in working poetry. And somehow that evolved to what we're doing uh, tonight, um, or this afternoon. I'm going to be writing the words, uh, everything that lives is holy, the William Blake um, proverb, unquote. Um, and I write it here so you can read it, because after uh, <laughs> the next things I do, probably you won't be able to read it, but at least you'll know what I'm trying to write. And the idea, uh, sometimes I will be responding to Ania's music. Other times she'll be responding to me. Uh, most of the time you may not know which is which. Uh, I think of that as the space in between. Um, but uh, Ania is also, I was going to talk a little bit about her experience with the uh, improvisations for other so thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here with you, Thomas. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much to the university for having us here. Let me. That's sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, as a classical violinist, when I started doing improvisational works, um, alongside all my classical gigs and freelancing and playing in symphony orchestra and Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center. It was something very new, and now I feel as though, as I play for audiences, it's something, as you were saying, oh, this is so exciting, it seems like it's in the air, and yes, it is, it truly is, and I, um, I think where I've come from is uh, the tradition of classical music always had uh, composers who experimented with improvisation to find their space in between, their creative uh, ideas and so there's an element of accident in finding new, new things to work with. I loved how Thomas created a sort of a form uh, 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 that seemed random in order to um, uh, inspire 
creative energy because composers need to do that. You create, um, you can create a scale. You can base um, your pieces on specific notes or ideas. So I've been experimenting with that for about 20 years, and um, I think this is very interesting for me because I started uh, with using um, sacred sites, so the energy and the idea of those places evoked. I moved to working with paintings as musical scores. And so you can imagine working cal with calligraphy, however abstract or with words, is sort of a natural progression, um, even after working with dancers. So I work with um, calligraphy as if I was with a dancer, in a way, with the move movement of the hand, as well as being informed by the, um, the words that are uh, being written. And so in this, uh, work I did at the Asian Art Museum, uh, being part Japanese, it was very interesting to hear from uh, Cuz what each word meant in Japanese, but also what the names were in Chinese, and then have those elements spontaneously in, in, in from the sound, as well as uh, use the energy that he was using in, in uh, creating the work. So it might be a little hard to mention, but you can see it happen here in, with, with Anglo letters. And, um, I think I'll just uh, stop there. Um, maybe one more thing. Um, I uh, have a piano trio, and I've been working with visual art with them for the past six to seven years, composing pieces that have progressively been using words instead of musical notation uh, to describe uh, uh, what to do. Because these classical musicians are so incredibly um, technically gifted, all I really need to give them is the space and I work with them and I train them to, to create something from visual art um, that inspires these pieces. So anyways, without speaking anymore, uh, we will begin.
first, yeah. we had a plan. Yeah. <laughs> Two hours after, yes. and he left. I called her up and I said, we're going to do something else. <laughs> I said, and he sent me what he, he was imagining. I thought that was, it was much freer and, and very interesting and colorful, and, and beads looked even different from this. So. <laughs> yeah, that's the beauty of improvisation. And it happens with my trio as well. We, we plan. It's even written out, and then it's always different. Thank you.